Well, good morning, church. It is good to be with you again. Last time you saw me, I had the majestic mustache. Now I'm back to baby face shootsius. That's my uh, alter ego. If I were a, a gang member in the 1920s, you know, prohibitionary, baby face shootsius, that would be me. So I instantly lose like 10 years of my life the second I lose facial hair. So maybe one day uh, the Air Force will let me be a man again and wear a beard. Maybe. I don't know. But yes, uh, I do serve in the Air Force as, a, as an active duty chaplain this morning. I am speaking to you, not in that capacity, but in the capacity of uh, a follower of Jesus and someone who has been called to preach his word. So making that distinction clear, I am just here to, to love you and to, to pour into you and to preach this morning. I was encouraged initially when Preston reached out and he said, hey, uh, we want to have you come and speak on this weekend. And I thought, oh, great, that's, that's phenomenal. I'm grateful for the opportunity. And then I looked at the text. And uh, if you want to go ahead and open your Bible, we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 2 this morning. And I, I started, you know, reading through that. And I thought, man, he really doesn't like me, does he? Um, you know, you start, you start out and you read it. And it, at first glance, it's great because you've got, oh, prayer. We all love to pray. That's phenomenal. By the end of the chapter... Paul starts stepping on all kinds of toes, talking about women leading within the church, and he goes as far as giving us arguably one of the most difficult verses to interpret in all of the New Testament. So I began thinking, I can just see how this went down, you know, in the staff meeting. They got to this text and they thought, who do we know that nobody will remember and will be gone shortly? You know, we could just call him up here, have him preach this, and then he'll disappear, and nobody will remember. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I know it didn't go down that way, uh, but they're not here to defend themselves, so I've got to cast a little shade, you know, because I can, right? I've got the microphone. Uh, but in all seriousness, it's, it's good to be with you this morning. I'm excited about this text. We have a lot to tackle, and there's a lot of goodness in this text. There's some, there's some great nuggets of truth that I think we're going to be able to draw out of here and apply to, to many different areas of our lives. So if you would, join me, 1 Timothy, chapter Chapter 2, starting with the first three verses, we're going to work through them together. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high place, positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. We're going to pause and we're going to pray. Father God, bless the preaching of your word. May it not return void. May you increase and I decrease. May you be glorified. Speak to our hearts and our minds. Draw us to repentance where it is needed. Bring encouragement and hope where it is needed. Let us glorify you in all that we do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we work through this chapter, I, I, I've kind of broken it down into three different sections. And, and we can see that at the beginning of these, this chapter, the first three verses, there's a clear command to pray for our leaders. At the beginning of the book, last week, you know, you can kind of see in the first part of the book that there's, there's this address, this idea that, that the gospel should change us. There should be this transformational change within our lives. And Paul is transitioning here in chapter 2 to how that looks in a corporate setting. And he gives us some guidance on it, and he's speaking directly to the church, to believers. And one of the things that he highlights over and over again in this chapter is to pray. There is a command to pray specifically for our leaders. He says, I'm urging that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. And then he goes on and he specifically mentions kings and people that are in high positions. Now, if we read this through an American lens, we could be quick to dismiss this. We could get to this point and say, well, we don't have a king. We just celebrated that fact on Thursday, right? So we don't have to worry about this. But in reality, I think we all know that Paul is not letting us off that easy. This could be read, pray for your government. Pray for the people who are appointed over you. And this could be difficult for us to read in any sense, but especially if you have leaders appointed over you that you don't necessarily agree with. People that you don't necessarily support their political policies or their stances. It could be challenging to come to a text like this and say, hmm, I'm not really sure I want to pray for them today. But Paul doesn't give us any kind of qualifiers. And I want to be clear here. Our political beliefs do not excuse us from the obligation of praying for our leaders. 
just because we disagree with them on a stance, just because we may not wholeheartedly support every single policy that they put forward, does not excuse us biblically from going to the Father daily and praying for them regardless. I have a, a friend who is also a chaplain, and uh, he, he shared with me the opportunity that he had to meet President Biden. And in the midst of the pomp and the circumstance and everything, everybody was lined up and, and the president was kind of coming down the line and, and shaking their hands. And, and th this friend of mine was, was in the official capacity of a chaplain, so he had his uniform on and he had his, his occupational cross up here and everything. And the president got to him and he, and he held out his hand and he shook his hand and he looked at him and he said, are you praying for me, chaplain? And I remember my friend sharing that story with me and my first thought was, well, I'm glad he didn't ask me that. Because I don't often pray for our president. I mean, I'm just being transparent. Sometimes it doesn't immediately come to mind to, hey, to say, hey, I need to be praying for our president. And my friend shared with me the conviction that he felt when he was asked that question. Because he doesn't share the same political beliefs. He doesn't share some of the same stances that President Biden has. And he hadn't prayed for him. And when the president looked him in the eye and asked him that question, he couldn't truthfully say yes and I think that's a reminder for us that there is no qualifier here. Paul doesn't say, hey, you pray for your leaders as long as they're godly and they choose to represent you in a godly way. We don't see that in the text. He doesn't say that you can continue to pray for them as long as they push the right kind of policies. He doesn't give us an easy way out. He says, pray for them, lift them up to the Father above. And we see this principle clearly articulated throughout the rest of the New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Peter has strong words about the, the position that we have in reference to honoring those appointed over us. Peter writes, be subject to for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as a people who are free, not using your freedom as a covering up for evil, but living as servants of God. And then listen to verse 17. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Now, in Peter's time period, in the context of him writing that letter, he was talking about honoring a man who was actively persecuting Christians and going as far as having them executed in public. And we don't see any kind of qualifier that excuses us from respecting or honoring them in that text either. And I believe it applies to our text here in Timothy when Paul urges us to pray for the kings, to pray for those appointed over them. And I know some of you are sitting here and you're thinking, you're hearing me talk about this and you're thinking, I do pray for them regularly. I just pray that they take a long walk off a short bridge. That's not what I'm talking about. And I, don't, I think you would, you would agree with me. That's not what Paul is talking about. There is an obligation here for us as a church to go before the throne and to lift up our leaders. Whether it's the leaders of this city, whether it's the leaders of this state, or the leaders of our nation. Why? Because we can't disconnect this command from the purpose of the command. Look back at verse 2. Why does Paul want us to pray for them? He says, so that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life godly and dignified in every way. There's the purpose statement. He says, yes, I want you to pray for them because they have influence over your life. Understand that the power that, that has been given to them is, in, is an authority tool. So pray for them that God can bless you through them. I've heard it said, there's an old adage that, uh, that is said in, in seminary circles, Baptist circles, things like that, that if you want fire in the pulpit, you need prayer in the pews. Well, I would argue that if we want revival in this nation, we need churches in prayer. That's ultimately what this comes down to because if over and over again in Scripture, we see the clear command for corporate prayer as a way to bring about change in a nation. Every great movement of God started with someone on their knees. It started with someone who was devoted to praying that God would bring revival in their nation, that God would bring its nation back to him. 
And we see that articulated even throughout the, the narrative of the history of Israel in 2 Chronicles 7 and 14 at the dedication of the temple. God is speaking to Solomon and he's saying, he gives a, a lot of qualifiers. He says, if this, then this, if this, then this. And in chapter 7 of verse 14, he gets to one of the best statements that we could draw from in, in relation to where we are as a nation. He says this, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and they would pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then... I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. What are the conditions? Prayer, humility, repentance. It starts with prayer. It starts with people who are committed to praying for their nation, that God will change hearts. Why? Because it isn't a policy problem. It's a sin problem. It's not a, a policy problem. That's, that's the manifestation of a heart issue. That's where we have to remember when we see things that are put forward that don't honor God. It's not coming. That's not the problem. That's often what we fight. But really, the heart of the issue is sin. It's people affected with a heart problem, and it's a sin issue at the beginning. What can change a person's heart? The Holy Spirit bringing that person before the throne and asking God to work in their heart. We will never see revival in this country until the church takes this command seriously. Until we recognize that our role in bringing about that revival and bringing out that repentance, yes, is being a light in the community, but it's also praying for that to take place. It's being intentional about praying for the people that God has put over us. We cannot forget that arguably prayer is the most powerful tool at our resource. It's, it's, it's the most powerful tool that we have at our disposal. What else could we possibly want to go to when we can talk to the creator of the stars? Why would we lean on anything else? Yes, I'm not saying that we should just back off and just pray and not vote. I'm not arguing that. Yes, exercise that right. Use that ability. But prayer, coupled with exercising that, is a biblical model of saying, hey, I'm going to continue to lift up the people that God has put over me because I have direct access to the king of the universe. Amen. I was reminded of this while I was serving as a, a youth pastor in Tennessee. And I was, I was working through seminary, and I was at a small church. It, it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't real large. It was in a rural community, and, and I was not making a lot of money, but I had been blessed by a family in the church that had given me the opportunity to, to live in, in their old farmhouse. They had a, a house that had been built in the early 1900s, so it was very poorly insulated. When the wind blew, the curtains moved. Uh, my record during the harvest season was like right in the middle of a bean field, so my record, I think one year, one October, is I caught 43 mice that month. Uh, so I, I had it figured out. I was like a, you know, an assassin going around getting these mice. Uh, but I was single and I was figuring it out and I was, I was living, you know, this, the single life, working my way through school and stuff. On the, the, the beginning summer of the year that I was going to get married, I started to get a little nervous. I started to think about how am I going to, to bring my wife into this this environment. And I started to kind of resent the church a little bit because I felt like I deserved a little bit more money. And at one point there, there was a, a, a little bit of a raise, but it wasn't really what I thought I deserved. So I was out mowing my grass and I was, it was a, a riding lawn mower. And I was just kind of thinking and praying while I'm, while I'm mowing my grass. And I, I did that a lot because it was just a good way for me to, to stay focused on what I was, uh, what I was praying about. In the midst of that prayer, I started to get a little angry with God. I started to, to kind of throw some things at him, if you will. It's kind of a one-way conversation. But I started to say, you know what, God? I can eat spam. I can eat ramen noodles. I can eat tuna fish. I can make it as a single guy. And I can do all of this. And, and I was using that as kind of ammunition against him to justify my anger and, and, and prove that I had a, a good reason to be resentful that I wasn't getting the money that I thought I deserved. So I'm throwing all this out. I'm like, God, I can do all of that. I can figure out. I could even eat these little mice if I had to. 
but I'm about to marry a woman and I'm about to be responsible for her. And what if I bring her into this home and I can't provide for her? What then, God? That's a pretty arrogant stance to take. But in that moment, God didn't speak audibly, but he spoke as clearly as I've ever heard him speak. As soon as I threw that out and I said, what then, God? He said, you'll ask me. And I felt about this big because I was reminded that ultimately it wasn't my responsibility. Yes, I have a a role to provide. Yes, I'm going to do my best to be the husband that God has called me to be. But when I don't have what I need, I go to my father. And guess what, church? It reminded me of the access to the one who placed the stars in the heavens and knows them by name. I have access to the same voice that calmed the seas. Why wouldn't I go to him when I needed something? And guess what? He's provided for all of my needs and most of my wants. There's some fishing gear out there that I still would like to have, but it will get there. But in that context, and we're talking about the leaders appointed over the most powerful nation in the world, why wouldn't we be praying for them? That's where Paul starts in this chapter. And he doesn't stop there. He goes on and he gives us a command to pray for the nations. Look at verses 4 through 7. Because he makes the qualifier statement in verse 3. He says, this is good. It's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. Who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? There is one God. There is one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. These verses are right on the heels of Paul's initial command to pray, and he's fleshing it out a little more. They're the purpose qualifiers, much like we saw in verse 2. He's saying, yes, pray for your leaders, but don't stop there. Pray for all people because God wants the nations to be reached with the Gospels. And we could spend a lot of time debating about the the meaning of all people from a soteriological standpoint. We're not going to do that this morning. Ultimately, what I would like to point us to is that what Paul is saying is that God wants people from every tribe, nation, and tongue to be reached with the saving power of the Gospel. That's what this, this text is outlining. He's saying pray for all of them. Why? Because God desires for them to be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth. What is the truth? That there is one mediator, that Jesus Christ stands in the gap, that he is the one who paid our ransom. That's the truth. That's why we pray. That's why we try to reach the nations with the gospels. This is a clear mandate throughout the rest of Scripture. We see it in the Baptist theme verse. You're like, what's the Baptist theme? Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the Great Commission. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Make disciples of all nations. There's a global priority when it comes to preaching the gospel. And there's a global priority when it comes to prayer. You know what I find sad and simultaneously encouraging at the same time? There are churches in other countries who are praying for America more than churches in America are praying for them. I can promise you that there are churches across this globe who have prayed for the church in America today. They have prayed that we would prioritize reaching the lost, that we would seek the face of God, that we would proclaim the truth of the gospel. They've prayed for our leaders. Are we praying for them? Many of them know the reality of living out their faith faith in a persecuted kind of environment. They know what it's like to live out their faith in the midst of persecution. They know the challenges of practicing their faith in a culture that prohibits the free exercise of religion. They've seen the consequences, and yet they choose to remain faithful. And I can promise you that there are many who are on their knees praying for us. Why? 
Because when it comes to these kinds of verses, they often read them a little differently than, than we do. When we read these kinds of verses, oftentimes we're so isolated in America that we have a tendency to think more about ourselves than we do about other nations. Because America is big and it's isolated. I mean, let's be honest. We can drive for days and still be in this country. We can drive for days and still be in Alaska. It's a big state. You go to Europe, you can drive for minutes and be in another country. Nations appeals a little differently in that kind of context. You see that there are people speaking a different language just minutes down the road. But in America, we have a tendency to just look at us and we focus on us and we think about us. It's a much different perspective than a global focus that we see in Scripture. But let me be clear, our God has a heart for the nations. He has called us to take the gospel to all of the nations. And that's a picture of heaven. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation. Praising God, worshiping Jesus on the throne. That's what we see outlined in scripture. And we're commanded to pray for them. Paul makes it very clear that it's only through Christ that someone can be saved. And our intercessory prayer on their behalf is a key component into them coming to the faith. So we see the command, pray for your leaders. Pray for all people. Pray for the nations. Pray that the gospel will reach them with, with the ability to, to bring them to saving faith. And then he transitions into different elements of corporate worship. So verses 8 through 15 is where we'll round out this morning. And he focuses on gender roles within corporate worship and, and a, a myriad of other things. But if you would, let's, let's read them together as we work through them. Verse 8, he says, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Verse 11, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman, a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Verse 15, yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. All right, Preston, Mr. Pastor Ron, you're up. I'm out. Let's pray. See what I mean? I was like, man, come on, guys. But let's, let's walk through this. Paul reemphasizes the power of prayer. He tells men, hey, you hold a prominent place in leading the church in that discipline. He's calling men to, to lift up holy hands, to pray, to lead in that capacity. And he touches on the appearance of dress for ladies. Now, I believe that he's not telling us that, that everybody has to dress like Little House on the Prairie. I don't believe that's what he's getting after here. I think he's, he's speaking to a heart issue and he's saying, don't let your outward appearance be the dictator of, of the change that is in you. Don't let that be the thing that you bring before God. Be modest in the way that you dress because a, a culture of that time period dressed in such a way that they, they felt like they were drawing attention to themselves and trying to, to earn favor to the gods. Paul is saying that's not how we approach our God. So remember that when you put clothes on, the way that you dress. And then verses 11 through 15, it gets really fun. He makes some strong statements. He touches on some things that are not politically correct. Uh, and in fact, there are churches and denominations that are divided over how to interpret these particular verses. Ultimately, I, I do believe that this is a text best handled by Ron or Preston. I'm not that guy, so I'm not going to break down the trajectory for our church and say, okay, this is how this is applied in this role or this setting, or this is what we believe about this particular word or anything like that. Uh, but I will say this, unless you do some serious hermeneutical jujitsu, you cannot get around the black and white words of these verses. You cannot. I mean, it's very black and white. Paul is very clear on how he wants corporate worship and the roles within corporate worship to be played out. You have to work really hard to get around these verses to make them say something other than what they really say in black and white. He points back to the creation of Adam and Eve. He points to the fall. All of that is the umbrella 
for, for the mandates for what he's, what he's giving here as far as commands. Now, does this mean that women don't have the same value as men? Absolutely not. In fact, the New Testament as a whole overwhelmingly uplifts women overwhelmingly puts them into a much more prominent role within society. We see that clearly articulated through the rest of Scripture, and you've heard that preached from this platform many times. What is Paul getting at here? What can, what can I do to, 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 to preach this text in the, in the capacity that I am here before you this morning without diving into the nitty-gritty of all of this? Here's where I'm going to camp out. Men, God has called you to lead. There is a command to be a spiritual leader. Period. Dot. He expects you to lead in the family and he expects you to lead in the church. So as I work through that, I'm going to camp out here a little bit. I want to talk to the men. I want to talk to the husbands. I want to talk to the fathers. I want to talk to the single guys. I want to talk to the grandpas, wherever you are. Ladies, here's what I need from you. I don't need any elbows. Let the Holy Spirit do the elbows talking, okay? But I want to talk to the men as we close out this morning. What is Paul pointing to in this text? He is highlighting the role that men have to be spiritual leaders. He's not lowering the women's importance or value. He's really just bringing up the idea that this is the way God sees a man's role in a spiritual capacity. So here's what I would like to say to remind us Men, husbands, fathers, God will hold you accountable for your leadership, whether you like it or not. You're leading somewhere this morning. My question to you is where? Paul doesn't say that men have the option to take up this role. He tells us it's already decided that, that men have been appointed by God to take on this role. Either we are leading our families toward Christ or we are leading them away from him. So don't miss this. Man, you set the spiritual trajectory for your family. You set the tone for your family. And some of you have completely set that role aside. And now something like this, something where you would step into a role of leadership is terrifying to you because you've lost that ability to speak into your family. You've lived for yourself for so long that when you try to direct your family, they laugh at you. Your wife doesn't respect you. She wants nothing to do with that leadership, and it bothers you. Well, guess what? It should. It should bother you. Because what I would like to do this morning is to call you back to repentance and remind you of the God-given authority that you have to lead your family. It may take years for you to gain that back, that respect back. It may take years of study and discipline and spiritual uh, diving into Scripture to try to, to see where God wants you to, to exercise that role, but it's a role that's been placed on you regardless. I want to challenge you to step up to be the head of the house this morning. Assume the role that God has called you to. We need men who are willing to lead in their homes. We need men who are willing to say, I will set the course for my family. I may not know everything that's in this book, but I'm willing to devote my time to study it. I'm willing to sit under the teaching of another godly man. I'm willing to let that man pour into my life. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to train and to raise up my family, to disciple my family. Men, it's not Beth Moore's responsibility to disciple your wife. It's not Veggie Tales' responsibility to disciple your kids. It's not this church's responsibility to disciple your kids. We don't have enough time. That role falls on the man within the family and the parents raising that family. You are the one God has called to lead. You are the one God has called to pray over your wife, to lead, to love her sacrificially, to guide her spiritually. And the thought of this terrifies us because I don't do that all the time. I don't fulfill this role perfectly. I'm a fellow guy just like you. And I'm not standing up here arrogantly. I'm just pointing to the fact that scripture sees this, this role outlined for us very clearly. It's there. We are called to step up 
and to lead and to guide our families. That may mean putting their needs before your needs. That may mean putting the Xbox controller down and picking up a vacuum instead. That's how we die for them in an Ephesians 5 kind of capacity. All of us would step in front of a bus for our families, but would we give up a fishing trip? That's, that's the idea of leading sacrificially that I'm talking about. Pray for your family. Go back to what Paul talks about in these earlier verses and recognize you have a great responsibility to pray for the protection of your family. Why? Because the enemy wants your family. Guess what? He's winning. When we look at our church and we look at our nation today and we look at the, some of the issues that we are dealing with, it is because men have stepped out of this role and they have assumed the back seat and they are not leading in the home and Satan is coming after our families. So what do we do? We repent. We say, hey, you know what? God, I'm not going to sit back and I'm not going to let this continue. I'm going to do whatever it takes to lead my family and set that trajectory for them. We need men to be the men that God has called us to be and to step up and lead like God expects us to lead. We need men who identify danger and they step up to protect their families. Part of my job requires that I pass a PT test and I hate running, not a fan of it. I do it because I have to. I'm not one of those weirdos who goes out and just like runs for fun just because it clears their head or whatever. If that's you, I don't know. Find a counselor. But <laughs> I'm, that's not me. I do it because I have to. And, and the benefits are it helps me have cardiovascular endurance, I guess. I don't know. As a chaplain, I don't really know how that factors in. But anyway, I do run. Um, and I remember a time where I was running around this lake. It was uh, while I was... Um, back home in Arkansas, and there was this beautiful little lake set up in an in a area that we were staying at for a little while. And I knew that I needed to make a couple laps around this lake to get the miles that I was supposed to kind of accomplish for, uh, for that day. So I'm running, and uh, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, and I'm, I'm looking at the sights. I'm trying to focus on my breathing. Remember, you know, just keep breathing and you won't die. And uh, as I'm running, I come up, the trail kind of comes up next to the water's edge. And I remember there was this goose, and he was kind of sitting by the water, and uh, I'm running, and he and I make eye contact, and I'm like, what's up? And he's like, what's up? And uh, everything was good. You know, we did a little head nod. I was cool. He was cool. I passed, kept running. So I make the first lap, and I come back around. And I'm coming back to this goose, and I remember we had an agreement the first time. He wasn't going to harass me or anything like that. And I'm within maybe 20 feet of him, and he sees me, and his head pops up. And he does one of these numbers, right? You ever seen this? The wings come out and the butt comes down and he's like, Hi-ya! and he's hissing and screaming and he's like coming after me, okay? And I just, I, I freeze because I'm like, bro, we were just okay. Why the hostility, you know? And I'm like having to step back because he's still coming. He's like, I don't care how big and how buff you are. I'm going to take your eyeballs and I'm going to eat them. You know, that's like the look on his face. And I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what's going on. And I'm trying to understand why he's so aggressive. And I look over by the water and there was Mama Goose. And she had about four or five little goslings and they had come up next to the water. They weren't there before. They were there now. And God dropped this in my inbox. In that moment, he said, oh, that the men of my church would defend their families this way. That they would look the devil straight in the eye and say, you may want my family, but you got to come through me first. And that we would stand up and say, I don't care if you're coming after my family. You're not getting through me. And that we would put our arms out and we would stand in the gap and we would say, I will pray for them. I will love them. I will serve them out of humility and sacrifice. And that we would step up to the plate and recognize the accountability that we have in the way that we lead. 
So we're going to enter into a time of prayer. We're going to transition out of this moment where we're looking at what God's word says and we're going to put it into practice. We're going to apply it. So men, I want to challenge you. Maybe this is the first step. Maybe this is the step where you say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead. Maybe you bring your family down. Maybe you come, you set the role, you set the example. You pray for your family. You pray for wisdom. You pray for discernment. You pray for unity. You pray for the city. You pray for its nation, our nation. Pray. I want to challenge all of us to keep these principles in our mind. Are we praying for our leaders? Are we praying for the nations? Are we praying for our families? So as we enter into that, I want you to do business with God as he does business with you. And I invite you to, to stand, to reflect, and to pray.